without the tape library, you wouldn't have had a channel going on air. So every single piece of music that was played was on a tape, and that tape was in our library on numer numerical order, the 40, 50,000 tapes. So we had to know where they were at all times. And they were, there was one copy which had to stay in the library, which was the A copy, and the B copy could go out to edits, um, which could be down in town or in air studios where we worked. Um, so we'd be packaging bags of tapes together every day. There might be 12 edits going on, and we'd send them off to town to, to different places on motorbikes. And sometimes we'd get the tapes back, and sometimes we wouldn't. So then we'd have to find out where those tapes were. And on occasion, both the A and the B copy would go missing. And then we used to have to get the hard copy, which was on one inch, from Security Archives, which was in a tube tunnel underneath Tottenham Court Road. So we'd have to request the tape to be brought up to us, send it up to the machine room and get it dubbed off, um, sometimes with minutes to go to get it on air. And if we didn't have the tape, we'd have to authorise who was going to exchange for another piece of music, which caused a lot of problems. So it was quite high tension in the library. It wasn't a kind of relaxed, laid back job. It was, um, yeah, pretty full on. Well, we were supplying transmission, um, MTV transmission, 24 hour music channel with the tapes to get the station on air. So we were dealing with the beta cam tapes, which are these ones, and we had 20, 30, 40,000 of these in the library, and they were all marked up with barcodes, and we had to manually barcode them. So we sat at a desk with a machine and manually barcoded each tape. I don't know if these have got. No, they haven't, but we put the barcode label on there, which was read by the beta cart machine in the transmission suite. So every 24 hours, we pulled 24 hours worth of tapes, so it's 40 an hour, and they had to be put into the machine by hand. So the librarians were selecting the tapes which the production teams at MTV wanted to play in their shows, which could be hanging out live, um, I can't remember all the names of the shows, but whatever they were. And we pulled them and put them into transmission and they went into the machine. Um, so it was a very manual job, really, and very organisational. Fun, but pretty full on, yeah. And it was all based around tapes and these machines. And we did a lot of logging on these machines, actually. Um, you know, where things were on tapes. Um, we did lots of pulling stuff out of archives and logging it. Um, and that was it, erasing tapes, bulk erase. We had a thing called a bulk eraser that somebody reminded me about the other day. We used to spend hours erasing tapes once they weren't needed anymore. Um, so they all just went, well, they were erased and that was the end of them. But uh, yeah, it was a very sort of organisational role. I think it was about eight or 10 librarians that worked over a 24 hour period. So there was, there was generally always somebody there. Every single piece of music was held on a one inch. So Every piece, the, I don't know how, I can't remember how many pieces of music you'd have on a one inch, but each one was put on its own beta, beta cart, beta cam tape. So we used to have to go down there sometimes. I went down and had a look round, and there were tunnels in the underground. It was a, it was a company, and it was an archive company. MTV used them to store their, their footage. So that was a really, really important, um, important place. It was holding all this sort of treasure, really. And um, sometimes the boxes weren't marked up. So I think if you open one of these, they're not that easy to, you'll find the log sheet in it. I can't work out how to do this. Oh yeah. So in here you've got the pink sheet, which is, yeah, the recording report. So we'd have to find out where that particular piece of music was. It might be seal, whatever seals, you know, or whoever it was, find it and then send that up to the machine room and say we want a copy of this tape and we need it in we need it in 10 minutes, so can you get it done now? And we'd have to be waiting by the machine, as if on quite a number of occasions both the tapes had been misplaced or they hadn't come back from the edit or they'd been lost or whatever. So you'd get that tape done and you'd rush it down and you'd stick it in the machine and it'd be going out on air sort of a minute later. And there were a lot of occasions like that which were quite full on, yeah. Um, well, hopefully you didn't lose it, but it did happen. So they had to come up from archives and there were thousands and thousands of these tapes and I do understand they've all been ditched now. They don't have them anymore, so... Um, but they were a, a treasure, a resource. So, 
Yeah, that was in the archives, which is underneath Tottenham Court Road. In old tube tunnels. And Winston Churchill had a war room there with a secret lift going down from somewhere else. I can't remember where that went from, but there's a secret lift going down the war. They had the war room down there as well. So uh, that was quite an interesting place. <laughs> Well, when I first started working MTV, well, at RTV, for MTV, which was 1990, all the racks were wooden. So they were all bars, um, and this is the Betacam tape, and we, had, we never had them in the boxes. We just used to chuck the boxes away. And actually, you can see there is, was a strip, and we had to put those strips onto the side of the tapes here. Well, there's one already on there, but we had to... Um, put a barcode label on there and we had all of our own initials so every time we, we were barcoding 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 tapes a day putting them on and then we'd, we'd store them like this twos and they went along a room like this would be one end to the rest to the end would be rows and rows and rows of tapes and then we got very technical and got metal racking called roller racking so you could fit a lot more tapes because we were always getting more and more and more tapes it was growing it was a growing machine so they were all done numerically, an A copy and a B copy. And I think if I can remember the A copy and the B copy were up, or down or next to each other, I can't remember. Um, and yeah, that was really important. They were properly marked with the A copy and the B copy. The A copy never left the building. That was the transmission copy and the B copy could go out to edits. Um, we weren't dealing with the rushes. We didn't have anything to do with the one inch tapes. That went to the machine room. We didn't view those. If we needed to find some, a piece of music on there, we'd send it upstairs with the sheet, the log sheet, and then we would deal with this. And it would come down to the library wrapped in paper with an elastic band around it, and we took it off and we filed it. And that was, it had to be in the right place, but we had four or five rooms filled with tapes. We had, well, I can't remember, 50, 60,000 tapes, a lot of tapes. And I can't remember what the numbering system was, but it was quite complicated. Um, a, B, C, all sorts of, you know, thousands, 20,000, 30,000. Um, yeah. So organisation was the key to that. And supplying per hour, each, each show had its own box and that had to go into the transmission suite. And then once an hour, the transmission guides would stack up the, fill up the beta cart machine with the relevant tapes and then they would play through the machine. But that was all done manually. So... It was, the technology was, was great and cutting edge at the time, but you needed a lot of people to run the machine, you know, and to supply the tapes and to organise it and to unload them and then refile them and then pull them every day. So we'd get a great long piece of computerised paper every day, which was 12 hours at a time with millions of, you know, loads and loads of tapes written on it. And we had to go through manually and pull all those tapes and put them in the right order into the transmission suite so they could go into the machine. But this system was used throughout the country because when I worked at, um, I left MTV to go to Wire in Bristol, which was the first cable network, and I set up the library system for them. And we used the same technology then. Um, and then from there I went to Live TV. I didn't work on the library there, but I, um, we worked on edit suites. So we st everyone was still using Betacam then, which was mid 90s. 95, 96, um, I think. Yeah, it was on Avid as well. But yeah, everyone was still using Betacam then. There's a little switch at the side of the tape, and when you flick that switch, you sort of, you seal the tape. You can't, it, it, it's like the seal's broken. If you want to reuse this tape after you've bulk erased it, which we used to do a lot of, I mean, this is a 30-minute tape. We wouldn't be using 30-minute tapes. We used 10-minute tapes. So there's still a lot of wastage on that tape because the music video would be three minutes so 10 minutes tape was was an expensive piece of kit so we used to erase them we used to put them through the machine and they used to go through the machine you get it out the other side and we used to just dump them in a sort of bin but then you they could be reused you could put tape over this bit and then you could reuse the tape so the tapes were reused um which was probably a cost issue um not necessarily for going on air but they were used for lots of other things um so yeah that was definitely a cost issue. I mean, a 30 minute you might have used for a longer programme. Um, but these went to the studio and they went off to edits. They might do a first edit on a reused tape. Um, and that would that would probably save an awful lot of money. So a lot of tapes were erased on the bulk eraser. 
um, yeah, and then you, you'd peel off the barcode label and you could just put another label on the top. I mean, it is a long time ago. It's hard to remember why we were actually erasing them. I was, I was just trying to think, why on earth were we doing all that erasing? But we spent hours erasing tapes. So it, I think it was the cost issue. Yeah, because it was more in, in technology then was, it was more valuable, wasn't it? It wasn't quite as throwaway as it is now. You wouldn't have a, something, a tape like this and just think you're going to lob it in the bin. It would need to be reused. That's you know, like the one inch. It was reused and it was stored. It was it was it, it was valuable enough to be stored in a in an underground, very secure environment, so that it was safe and we could retrieve it if we needed to. And we did do that a lot. So, yeah, the the, the hardware was valuable and that was very valuable because that was archive footage. A lot of it was archive footage of unplugged performances, people that maybe had you know, had done a, an Unplugged or George Michael with Elton John, that one product, that one performance, which was really, you know, it was a one-off um, at Wembley, for instance, you know, when Elton John came on and did The Candle in the Wind with, with George Michael, that would have been on, you know, that, well, that was somewhere and that was really important, that was logs, and we could retrieve that to use that particular recording. So when you pick up a tape, um, it's it's a bit the same as a as a tape that you would have played in your tape recorder. You, you'd pick it up like this. You would never be putting your fingers in there because that's where the tape's running through. You've got your reel to your reel, so you're never touching in there. That's important. That you hold the tape like this. And you put it into the machine like this. It would have gone in like that. These don't work, but it went in like that, and then it came out. So you always hold them, the tape like this. Um, you, you can pull that back by pressing a pen into that little thing there. I'm not sure why you'd need to do that, but if you wanted to do that, you can do that. Like you used to do on tapes, you'd sometimes be, you could roll them on like that. But yeah, you hold the tape like that and you put it into the box, like so, and you're not touching around the tape, because the tape could be damaged with fingers, grease and spills of coffee. And people did used to drink coffee. Tapes did used to get damaged. You know, the transmission guys were there 24 hours a day, overnight, and they'd have coffee and they'd have their sandwiches and things. And yeah, stuff could get spilt into that tape and it could be wrecked. And then you'd have to redub it. Yeah, so if you're on a shoot, you're doing an OB shoot, what you're shooting is very, very precious. So you're shooting it onto beta or in the old days, I suppose, onto one inch, but that's really important. If you lose this piece of kit, you've lost your work. So it is really important. So that bag being sent off to an edit was a piece of very precious goods. You know, we wanted to know, we used tried and tested motorbike drivers. We had Mark, the biker from MTV, for instance. Mark, the biker, took all the tapes and he was really good. Some, some riders were not so careful, but if those were damaged, you'd have to go back in, you know, supply the whole edit again um find the master tapes redub them it, they were very precious pieces of kit these so that library was security locked nobody else could come into the library apart from us we used to let people in um, it wasn't somewhere that anybody was allowed to come in and walk around because if those tapes weren't walkabout you'd lost your your valuable maybe one-off concert where something had been recorded something special happened some guests came on unexpectedly to do a guest performance with some big star and it was important that that was really carefully looked after so it was quite a it was quite a sort of um it was sort of a sanct sancti sort of sanctity place if that's not the word what's the word it was a <clears throat> hallowed ground almost a library you know it was you weren't nobody was just allowed to walk in there we weren't supposed to have hot drinks in there and all that sort of thing um yeah they were very important pieces of kit these tapes we were looking through tapes, we were searching for things. Sometimes you might get back, you might get a box back with 10 one inches in it and you didn't know which one you needed to use because you didn't have this piece, the logging sheet had been separated from the correct tape. So you'd open this up or this wasn't even in it and you, so you didn't know what, the, what was on the tape and so you'd have to send it up to the machine room, um, book an hour 
of their time or maybe two hours or maybe three hours for them to check through to find a piece of music and maybe it wasn't on that tape and you'd have to go down and you'd have to get another box and look through another load of tapes. So it's quite a costly business. So this sort of whole logging that we used to do manually, you can see this is handwritten, it all had to be done manually and we did it manually all the logging of all the tapes that we did. It was, it was really important, this paperwork was really important and pieces of paper went missing. I remember, I remember getting into a skip outside the pub in Camden, going through bins looking for tapes in a skip because we couldn't find it and needed to go on air. I think that was a low point. <laughs> Think, well, we're just gonna have to get in the skip and we're gonna have to look through these back bin lines, bin liners, because we don't know where the tape is, we can't find the one inch, so we're gonna to have to search. And we went through so many tapes and we found the tape. There you are, and it went on air. But that's having looked, I mean, how it ended up in the skit, that's a whole other story, but <laughs> zero to zero two. And then you've got every minute clock and opening title sequence. So that's how you had to log tapes. Intro one to six, and then 0528 to 0557, cutaway of the camera. 0557 to 1224 more whatever it is you have to you know you had to log by the time what does it say there uh, yeah the time the minute the frame hours minutes seconds and frames and it had to be logged in detail like that so that you could find something if you needed it so you had a good record of what what was what and where things were for the beaters you kept it around the tape so you'd put your paperwork in, the, in with the tape. So when you opened that tape, the paperwork of what was on that, and if it was a 10 minute music tape, it would only be quite a short log sheet. It wouldn't be a long log sheet like this, but that was kept around the tape. Yeah, so that when you opened the tape, it was in there. But these were not stored. Once your barcode label is what was on, you weren't keeping the box. You were just keeping it like this on the, on the racking and you pull it, put it in your box in the right order that is going to be played every hour, box per hour for 24 hours, into the suite, in the beta cart, played on air by the transmission guys, back out in the box, sometimes in an order, sometimes not, and then you refiled it all back into the library and so it went on. So fastidious organisation, that's what I would say really about the library. Yeah, my brain has just gone as to how we actually, how we remembered what the filing system was. I'd, I'd probably need to see it again to remember how we how we knew where everything was. Yeah, the beginning of each rack was, was marked. Yeah, it was all marked. So we knew where to put everything. Yeah, that's fairly obvious, isn't it, really? I just, when you've not been doing it for a long time, you forget. But yeah, we every, every rack was marked and we you'd roll your rack and you'd go to the right aisle, the right letter, the right beginning of the right number, then you go down to the final number, I think about six or seven digit numbers. Yeah, so they were all put in the right place so that you knew where to pull them from. Uh, yeah, it's great. I mean, it brings back a lot of happy memories, really. Um, it was really hard work, but it was great fun. We had a really, really good time. And yeah, it was of an era, wasn't it? It was, uh, yeah, it was just really good fun. Yeah, really enjoyed it. And um, cutting edge, really, at the time and working for MTV in the early 90s was exciting. And yeah, it was really good. Really enjoyed it. It's lovely to see them. See all the. I mean, that looking at that, it's like oh, all the hours that we we were sitting logging tapes. We had to do a lot of logging, and we use those machines. Um, so yeah, it's exciting. It's nice to see them again. Really nice.